So welcome everyone to our special section. My name is Marília Bassetti, and I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the Brazilian Keynesian Association. It's my great pleasure to introduce Fiona Trejena to our panel today. She has a very, very impressive background. So let me do, let, let me introduce her in a few words. Fiona holds the South African Research Chair in Industrial Development. She's a professor of economics at the University of Johannesburg. She also has a PhD in economics from the University of Cambridge. Her primary research focus is on issues of structural change, the industrialization, industrial development. Fiona is involved in economic policy issues in South Africa and internationally, and sits on a number of boards and advisory panels. So among her most recent publications, we will find Do Productive Capabilities Affect Export Performance? Evidence from African Firms, published this year at the European Journal of Development Research. Uh, she also published a few chapters at the Oxford Handbooks of Industrial Hubs and Economic Development, such as Heterodox Approach to in Industrial Policy and the Implications uh, for Industrial Hubs, and uh, the other one, uh, Gender Industrialization and Industrial Hubs. Uh, she also has another publication, The Structural Change in Economic Dynamics from last year, Escaping the Middle Income Technology Trap, a Comparative Analysis of Industrial Policies in China, Brazil, and South Africa. Uh, so the topic Fiona chose to speak on today, it's structural change, industrialization and development, emerging directions in policy and research. So we will have 50 minutes for presentation, followed by about 30 minutes of questions and answers. You can all use the chat box for the Q&A. And I should point out that this meeting is being recorded, as you all heard right in the beginning. So Fiona, thank you again so much for joining us, especially in such a difficult time. It's really, really fantastic to have you here today. So you may start your presentation. Uh, thanks, uh, Marilia. It's really nice to see you and uh, other friends uh, here. Um, greetings to, to everybody from South Africa. Uh, it, it's really a, an honor for me to be speaking here at, at this conference. Um, even though I wish that I was I was there in, in and we were all together in person, but uh, maybe some other year. Um, I've been following for for some years um, the activities of, of AKB um, and the conferences, um, as well as uh, the articles in Brazilian Keynesian Review. I, th I think most of them are in English now, and there's often uh, articles there of of, uh, of interest uh, uh, to me and that I've referred to to my students and so on. Um, and I, I guess I've always felt uh, admiring and perhaps a little bit envious um, of the, the heterodox research community uh, there in Brazil, um, which seems uh, to have so much uh, depth and, and, and vibrancy, um, I guess, com compared to uh, 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 many other countries, including my own. Um, and uh, for me, it's always a, a special pleasure to, to engage with a Brazilian audience. Um, because uh, the kinds of issues um, that uh, I'm working on a lot in my research, like structural change, industrialization, uh, deindustrialization, um, these are very active uh, topics um, in, uh, in Brazil, perhaps more so than um, in any other country, I think. Um, probably maybe a, a combination of the strong structuralist tr uh, tradition in Brazil, as well as maybe the, the reality of uh, deindustrialization and its consequences. So it seems to be um, you know, issues that really engage uh, researchers there. Um, so unlike sometimes when one is uh, presenting in other countries and you, uh, you have to kind of uh, explain <laughs> some of the background, um, in, in Brazil, there are many people working on, on these issues. And so it's always great to, to have conversations and uh, I always come away uh, learning a lot. Um, I guess it's also interesting for me, given the, the various uh, parallels between my own country, South Africa, um, and uh, Brazil. Um, I think there are, of course, there are differences, but there are also commonalities and uh, inequality, challenges of structural change and catching up and so on. Um, so it's always a, an interesting engagement. Um, 
as we were chatting a, a bit at the beginning, it, it turned out to be a bit of a kind of Latin American uh, themed week of, of presentations uh, for me. Um, uh, yesterday I was uh, presenting in an event co-hosted by, by Center for, for Studies in Economics and Development in, in Argentina. Um, and uh, next week, uh, Danilo and I will be um, sharing a platform um, in Elades, the, the Sapal School. I'm looking forward to, to that um, on, on, on different topics. So um, really happy to be here. Um, and yeah, thanks again for, for the invitation. Um, I'm going to share my, uh, my screen. <clears throat> yeah. So um, I guess the it's quite a, a broad session. So I thought, um, and because we have a reasonable time for the session, that in, instead of presenting um, an, an individual paper, I would develop a, a bit of a broader presentation. Uh, so the topic that I'll be talking on is uh, structural change, industrialization, development, uh, emerging directions in, in policy and research. So what I've tried to do in this uh, presentation um, is, is to pull together, I guess, some, some thinking and, and research quite broadly around the topic um, and kind of looking at the, 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 I say the structuralist agenda um, from a, both a research and, and a policy perspective um, and what are some of the, the new kind of uh, developments that I think we need to take into account um, in, a, in a structuralist approach to development. So um, I'm, I'm going to talk uh, first of all just uh, briefly to to five of those. Um, I'm sure there are there are others, um, and uh, then I'll talk a bit about the concept of uh, transformative industrialization. Um, I would like then to to share a couple of uh, uh, a snapshot of a couple of uh, research papers. I'll just see how the the time goes and uh, whether we have time to 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 get into those at all. Um, and then lastly, just very briefly, um, I thought to mention what I see as some of the, um, the dynamic uh, research directions in this field. So yeah, I think I'll just actually pass over this because I, I, I'm sure with, with this audience, uh, everybody is, is familiar with the, the classical structuralist approach. Um, here I'm talking less about the, <clears throat> the, so the kind of macro aggregates but uh, more in terms of uh, the structures understanding of uh, industrialization, the role of manufacturing uh, and, and the catching up. Um, and I'm going to, to pick up on, um, on five issues that I think are, are some of the emerging developments um, that, that we need to take account of uh, in, in policy and, and research. Um, first of all, the, the kind of changing boundaries of, of the industrial and um, activity specificity within sectors. I'm going to talk a little bit about value chains um, and then uh, for IR and other um, technological changes, um, uh, briefly on, on climate change as it relates to industrialization, um, and then briefly as well about uh, implications of, of uh, the pandemic. So to, to go briefly to the first of these. <clears throat> Um, so here I'm thinking of through the kind of sector-based approach, um, which is in some ways one of the foundations of a, of a structuralist approach to, to economic development, um, understanding the economy in terms of sectors, um, and kind of looking at that, uh, the relevance of it with the, the various economic changes um, that we can observe. So I think one of these is the, the boundaries become, between sectors um, are becoming increasingly blurred. Um, obviously, there are still fundamental differences between manufacturing services, agriculture, and so on. But at the boundaries, um, I think there's a, a kind of fuzziness, um, and partly in relation to, to technological changes, um, as well as the growing um, integration of, of sectors. So at the, the kind of the borders of sectors, sometimes it's difficult now to say where does one sector end and, and the other begin. I think we also see a, a growing um, heterogeneity among activities uh, within sectors. So whilst of course there's always been a, a heterogeneity within uh, manufacturing, within services and so on, um, I would say if we compare uh, now to maybe the time, uh, let's say the 50s and 60s when uh, structuralist perspectives were, were being developed, 
we see now um, more heterogeneity uh, within each of the sectors. Um, more differences, for example, in the scope for, for cumulative productivity increases, um, for, for growth pulling and so on. <clears throat> um, and just to make an example, um, the, the concept of uh, industrialization of, uh, of freshness, which, uh, for example, Chris, K Chris Kramer from, from SOAS has been working on, and we have also brought into some of our, our, our joint work, um, where uh, he and uh, colleagues have looked at some of the changes within the, uh, the agricultural sector, um, and where some aspects of the agricultural sector become increasingly industrialized. So even those classified as agricultural activities, but they end up having some of the properties um, of, of, of manufacturing. It's like a pseudo industrial uh, process um, with maybe some of the learning by doing, increasing returns to scale and so on. While of course other aspects of, of agriculture are still uh, very traditional, particularly in, in developing countries and have very little scope for increasing returns to scale and, and so on. So I think it's, it's clear that the, the structuralist perspective, which sees manufacturing as the engine of growth, uh, remains relevant. There are still um, important common denominators within each sector that differentiate manufacturing from services and so on. So even with the fuzziness, the, the integration, the heterogeneity and so on, we still see these kind of common characteristics of, of, of each sector. But at the same time, there's a need for perhaps a more nuanced approach than in the time of the 1950s and 60s, um, including um, going to the subsectoral level, I think is a, an important uh, avenue of, of, of research um, because we see, for example, some subsectors of uh, services or even of agriculture being more growth pulling than some of the subsectors of, of, of manufacturing. So I think for, for me, it's a bit about on the one hand, yeah, the sectoral analysis remains relevant, but let's also uh, go beyond that to, to the subsectoral level. Um, and in terms of industrial policy implications, I think one is that the importance of a kind of an industrial policy type approach also for other sectors, uh, not only for, for manufacturing, um, as well as obviously industrial policy has always had a subsectoral element uh, by its nature of uh, sector targeting in industrial policy industrial policy never just targets manufacturing, but subsectors within that. But I think recognizing the heterogeneity, uh, it, it makes that even more important uh, within industrial policy. Uh, secondly, I would like to talk a bit about value chains. Um, and uh, I'm drawing here on uh, some of the work of, of, of myself and Antonio Andrioni, also some of um, Antonio's uh, uh, separate work or with, with co-authors and uh, some of the thinking of, uh, of Lindsay Whitfield um, on this. So value chains are of course not something uh, new. Uh, they've been there for, for a long time, but uh, in recent years, perhaps we've seen um, the rising importance of, of global value chains, um, which is, it reflects in the growth in, in intra-industry trade uh, in intermediate goods. So what's sometimes referred to as a vertical specialization industrialization through, through GVCs, uh, some authors will argue that it, it challenges the old um, import substituting, export orienting uh, industrialization uh, paradigms because it's uh, uh, because of the, the, the growth in, in uh, intra-industry trade through, through GVCs. Um, one of the distinctive aspects here is that um, we find that powerful uh, lead firms have a, have a role in um, controlling access to, to markets, um, flows of, of material and, and, and knowledge within GVCs um, <clears throat> in a way that uh, was, was not the case uh, to the same extent as, as previously. So in terms of the, the, the impact on, on developing countries and particularly low-income countries, um, on the one hand, um, GVCs uh, make it easier for, for low-income countries um, to break into manufacturing because they don't need to, to have capabilities along the whole value chain. They can kind of gain a foothold into manufacturing in, in easier segments of, of, the, of the value chain. But it also brings the risk um, for firms and for countries of being stuck in the, in the low-value added parts of, of uh, value chains. And I will talk a bit more about uh, those risks. So um, one of the arguments uh, from uh, Lindsay Whitfield, which I'm reflecting here, um, is that 
where firms or countries um, get stuck in the, the low value added parts of, of, of value chains, this can weaken the, the growth pulling um, potential of, of manufacturing for, for, for development. Um, that uh, exporting through the GVC route um, can, can reduce um, increasing uh, returns to scale, which is obviously one of the key drivers of, of manufacturing as an engine of growth. Um, weaken domestic linkages between manufacturing and the rest of the domestic economy. Um, and also weaken the link between uh, manufacturing and, and innovation because countries might be producing manufacture, um, but without the, the innovative side um, and the R&D side where that's uh, located um, in the, the, the lead firm uh, country. Um, and also that where um, those lead firms in the, in the value chain um, have enough buying power, they can capture uh, the productivity gains um, from increasing returns to scale along the value chain. So for instance, even where the manufacturing portion of the value chain is located in a developing country um, and where there are productivity gains associated with increasing returns to scale, sometimes those cannot be captured by that firm in the developing country and plowed back into development, but the lead firm with the buying power can, can uh, capture some of those uh, returns. So these are some of the ways in which uh, she argues that um, I guess an excessive focus on GVCs and maybe not GVCs per se, but being stuck in the, the low value added part of GVCs can reduce the growth pulling potential of, of uh, manufacturing. And in cases like that, um, where uh, manufacturing firms in developing countries are focused on, on just the final assembly part of the value chain, um, it may bring gains in terms of uh, balance of payments and employment, but not necessarily as a, a real driver of, of industrialization and, uh, and structural change. So it can be associated with what, what can be called a kind of thin industrialization. So yes, there's manufacturing, but it's not really a manufacturing that, that drives uh, structural change. Um, and uh, from the, some of the work from uh, Antonio and myself on this, we've also looked at the, the risk for, for middle-income countries um, that uh, where there's been a, a, a a focus on global integration, but without a development of domestic uh, manufacturing capacity. Um, they run the risk of um, kind of a domestic delinking and hollowing out the domestic manufacturing sector. So where uh, domestic, um, where manufacturing um, is uh, too strongly just oriented into value chains um, without linking back into the, the rest of the domestic economy. Um, then instead of spurring industrialization can actually uh, in some ways hollow out uh, the domestic manufacturing. So of course, all of these is, is not inevitable. It's not to say that, oh, involvement in GVCs leads to all of these consequences, but it's more highlighting what are some of the risks uh, to avoid. Um, different scholars have, have proposed uh, different strategies for, for developing countries' engagement with uh, value chains. For example, uh, Kuen Lee and some of his co-authors have advocated uh, what they call the in-out-in model. So engagement in the early stages of industrialization and then disengagement to build up capacities um, and capabilities and then re-engagement at a higher level. Um, <clears throat> I think from the, the, the work which we've been doing, um, it, it really underscores the importance of, of upgrading uh, within value chains. And part of the rationale for this is that when we look along uh, value chains, the types of activities with the, the highest um, barriers to entry, so the, the most difficult to get into, um, going along with that is, is typically having uh, the highest uh, returns. Um, so to get into those more desirable parts of the value chain, um, it really puts an emphasis on the need for, for upgrading of all types, process upgrading, product, functional, intersectoral upgrading. Um, and this, of course, requires uh, higher thresholds in terms of capabilities, because getting into the, the more desirable um, parts of the value chain, uh, it, it's not just a, a piece of cake. Uh, it, it requires that incremental building up of, of capabilities in order to break in. And, and what uh, Antonio and I have referred to as uh, linking up while linking back. So link a model that links up with value chains while also linking back with the domestic economy to avoid that hollowing out and to ensure that the engagement with value chains can be uh, part of growth pulling. Um, the, the third aspect that I, I thought I will talk about in terms of uh, emerging trends and, and how we kind of bring those into a, a structuralist agenda 
um, is around uh, 4RR and uh, broader technological change. So I think uh, we have long recognized the, the importance of um, innovation, of uh, technology intensity, um, technological upgrading um, for, for industrialization. So in some ways we can see, we can see innovation and, and technological upgrading as part of the micro foundations uh, of structural change. Um, and these are important for, for competitiveness, um, for, for product complexity and sophistication, um, for, for keeping pace and, and catching up, um, for um, medium and high tech industries tend to have uh, stronger spillover effects and, and, and linkages and, and, and so on. Um, and particularly in the case of, of late industrializers uh, in developing countries, um, with the fast pace of, of technological change, uh, technological upgrading is, is obviously uh, crucial, even, even though not, uh, not, not easy. Um, and uh, productive capabilities are, are absolutely central for this. So, so briefly on the uh, fourth industrial revolution, um, what is new about it? What is not new? Um, I think it's, it's clear that there are things which are qualitatively different um, and, and new in, in the four our, our technologies which are, which are emerging. Um, it's not only incremental changes. Um, and one of the distinctions is that the international diffusion of technology in the 4RR is a lot faster than in um, early industrial revolutions. Um, so there's this exponential velocity or the speed of technological change. Um, the, the scope of, of that change is, is very wide and the impact um, is, is systemic to a great extent uh, than previously. But we also need to recognize that the, the changes, the technological changes associated with 4R are not only these dramatic uh, disruptive changes. I think it's a combination of, of incremental um, and disruptive changes or both revolutionary and, and evolutionary changes. So looking briefly at the, at the developing country context for the 4R, for the um, there's a really um, a high degree of heterogeneity among developing countries. So when we look, for example, at uh, China and South Korea, um, which are really at the, the frontier of, of 4R as uh, not, not only users, but also as producers of, of 4R technologies. Um, and then we compare to um, some of other developing countries, which are still uh, really lagging behind um, and uh, probably still in the second, third phases of, of the, the Industrial Revolution. Um, so these Industrial Revolutions are not happening sequentially. It's not that you finish one and then you move to the next one. Um, in many uh, low-income countries, um, especially here in Africa, um, they are still undergoing um, elements of, of the early Industrial Revolutions. And beyond that heterogeneity um, between countries, we also see a lot of um, heterogeneity across sectors and even across manufacturing sectors uh, within countries. So to take the example of uh, robotization, um, when we look at the, the data on, on uh, the use of, of uh, robots, um, including in, in countries like uh, Brazil, South Africa, and so on, we find uh, a, a huge unevenness uh, across manufacturing sectors. So typically the use of robots is uh, concentrated in a few sectors uh, such as auto um, and uh, with very little use in, in uh, some other sectors. So this also connects um, the kind of the sector profile of for our technologies within countries connects with the, the heterogeneity across countries um, because uh, to some extent it, it, it depends on countries uh, sectoral uh, composition and the, the profile of manufacturing so for instance countries with a well-developed um, auto, auto manufacturing sector they're going to show up as uh, uh, having a, a high use of, of, of robots and advancement of four hour technologies because of that composition of the sectors um, so countries uh, manufacturing composition and degree of industrialization uh, will affect the, the extent of, in this case, robotization, as, as well as uh, more broadly. Um, I think some of the um, distinctive aspects of, of developing of the developing country context, even with that uh, heterogeneity that I mentioned, um, obviously most developing countries are, are further from the technological uh, frontier. Um, there's a, a, a gap in well, uh, capabilities in general, but in particular digital capabilities. Um, developing countries tend to be uh, less competitive in, in uh, technology and skills. 
so that there's a, a, a greater danger of um, instead of catching up as would have been the, the goal in a structuralist perspective, but being a, a further left behind. Um, and one aspect of that is that the, the types of skills which are disproportionately needed um, in, in a new or, or, or growing jobs um, are relatively scarce um, in, in developing countries. Um, and that, um, I guess, yeah, and, and then another characteristic is that the, the lower unit cost of labor in, in developing countries actually reduces the incentive um, to automate because any cost saving benefits of, of automation are less in developing countries um, because of, of, of cheaper labor. But then on the other hand, we find that some of the automation in, in developing countries is not actually cost driven. Um, so it's driven by factors um, other than, than wage costs. For instance, um, uh, quality control being seen as better with automation um, or also requirements uh, from being part of a global value chain. Um, so for instance, uh, if it's a factory of uh, Volkswagen uh, in a developing country, it might not be cost effective necessarily to automate, but it's part of the uh, requirements um, along the value chain. So automation in, in developing countries is not only cost driven, but, but, but uh, driven by these other factors. Um, and I think another aspect uh, affecting developing countries in particular is the, uh, the reshoring of, of, of manufacturing jobs um, to, to developing countries. So at the moment, I think it's still on a, a small scale, um, but it's, it's something which is, is increasing um, uh, that with, with automation, developing countries lose some of the uh, kind of competitive, competitive advantage due to, to uh, low unit uh, labor costs. So it's, it becomes more affordable for, for lead firms um, to reshore um, some, some jobs um, to, to, uh, to the home economy, which can also contribute to, to deindustrialization in, in developing countries. So I think lastly on, on uh, 4IR, um, thinking through kind of a, a sort of structuralist uh, perspective on, on the 4IR, I think it's important to approach uh, 4IR um, as part of an industrialization and, and structural change agenda. Um, and part of this is that to succeed in, in the 4IR, um, it, it takes everything that you need to succeed with industrialization um, and, and more on top of that. So it doesn't, uh, all of the things that have mattered all along for a country to be able to industrialize uh, and to have a dynamic manufacturing sector and dynamic uh, structural change and so on, they are the same things which are needed for success in the 4R with an additional set of uh, for our related uh, requirements, but it doesn't take away the, the, the importance of, 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 of the old requirements. Um, and in particular, productive capabilities in, in manufacturing are important for, for our success. And what's important here is not only productive capabilities directly in for our activities like robots and so on, but productive capabilities um, across manufacturing. So we need both um, kind of traditional industrial capabilities as well as um, new and emerging uh, for our type of, of capabilities um, and at all levels from basic, intermediate and, and advanced. Um, and yeah, from a, from a policy perspective, it's important to identify where, where do countries have, have gaps in kind of digital capabilities. Um, and the various uh, kind of four hour activities have, have minimum sort of thresholds and preconditions, uh, both for participation as a, as a user and as a producer. So I guess identifying where that gap is in for particular countries uh, is important from a, from a policy perspective. Um, and uh, uh, last in, in terms of policy, um, what we call like a transversal enablers are, are really crucial. So these are things which are important across the economy for, for our success so around skills, productive capabilities, digital infrastructure, such as um, ICT connectivity, um, regulatory governance framework, and so on. So these sort of transversal enablers are, are, are key, along with um, uh, policies targeting specific uh, sectors and activities. Uh, last time, uh, okay, no, not lastly, but I'm going to talk about um, impact of, of, of climate change on a kind of uh, industrialization and a structuralist agenda um, a bit briefly, because I'm hoping to come back to it uh, a bit later in the presentation. So I think it, we, we all recognize now, well, 
all uh, living there, all amongst us uh, here on this call, I'm sure. Um, the importance and, and the urgency of, of climate change is one of the fundamental problems facing humanity. Um, and we do need to recognize the importance of um, well, industrialization as, as a contributor to, to anthropogenic uh, uh, carbon emissions and, and, and hence to, to climate change. Um, yeah, maybe on, on, on a personal note, I guess, um, in, in recent years, I've, I've been feeling that this has been a gap in, in my own uh, research that, uh, I mean, for, for a long time, I've been working on industrialization, industrial policy, need more manufacturing and so on, um, which I, I still feel that that, that that is the case, that we uh, industrialization is absolutely fundamental. But I feel like it's a gap. Uh, as a researcher um, and as a policy person to work on that uh, and work on industrialization without also thinking about the, uh, the climate change um, aspects of it. So for developing in, um, countries in particular, there are these dual goals of, of industrialization um, and the, the mitigation of, uh, of carbon emissions. Um, but given that industrialization is a contributor, there can be a tension uh, between these goals. Um, there is, of course, the potential for, for decarbonizing um, industrialization um, and for following a, a green industrialization path, a green industrial policy, and so on, um, which is increasingly, uh, I think, an, an area of, of research and, and focus and policy. Um, and this brings um, particular both challenges and opportunities uh, for late industrializers um, in developing countries. So obviously the, the advanced economies of the world, when they were industrializing in the previous century, um, they didn't have to do so with the obligation of also reducing emissions um, during their early industrialization. As for example, um, African countries that are trying to industrialize now face this additional need of, of also mitigating um, emissions. Um, so, um, I think from a policy perspective, it's also important to look at what are the opportunities of this, uh, of, of uh, green industrialization for, for late industrializers. Um, and it really needs agility in uh, industrial policy to identify what are those growing sectors of, of, of manufacturing that are associated with, uh, with green industrialization um, and how economies um, can get into those as producers at an early enough stage, so that they're not only consumers of these technologies, um, but also producers. And then uh, the last thing which I'll be talking about in terms of um, these kind of emerging uh, trends and, and, and challenges for, for industrialization is, I guess, maybe le less of a structural one than the, the last ones I was referring to. Um, but uh, just briefly looking at the, the implications of the pandemic for, for industrial development and, and policy. So we, can, we have seen a number of uh, short to medium term um, effects of the pandemic on, on manufacturing firms over the past uh, year and a half. Um, some of these are, are direct effects on, on manufacturing firms through the illness and death of workers, um, disruptions to production due to, to quarantine, temporary firm closures and so on. Um, we've also seen disruptions to, to manufacturing production due to, to containment measures, um, including your know, temporary closures, um, social distancing measures within factories that reduce uh, productivity and output. Um, I think particularly in the, in the earlier stages of the pandemic, um, we have observed a lower uh, demand for manufacturers, both uh, domestically um, due to decline in incomes, um, as well as um, a lower external demand uh, for manufacturers um, due to decline in incomes internationally, and particularly in the early stages, um, due to some restrictions and uh, disrupting, uh, disrupted supply chains. Um, so one of the things uh, which, um, we've been working on um, is, is how to understand uh, the impact of the pandemic on manufacturing firms um, and some of the, the heterogeneity in the way that manufacturing firms um, have been affected, um, both within and, and between countries. Um, so I think uh, here it's important to, to look for, in the first instance at um, the prior conditions within a, a country in, in, in manufacturing. So typically um, countries which have a, a larger, more robust, uh, dynamic manufacturing sector, more complex, more diversified, stronger productive capabilities and so on, will be in a better position um, to, 
uh, to withstand a shock, whether it be the pandemic or something else. Um, and I think what's also important to emphasize here around prior conditions is that these are not things which can be built up overnight. It's the outcome of uh, changes and, and also choices um, over a long period of time, um, which have put some countries in a much better position to withstand the negative shock and also to take advantage of, of new opportunities that have opened up. Um, and then obviously the, the pandemic itself uh, has been uh, different uh, across countries in terms of the, the severity um, of illnesses. Um, and then uh, containment measures uh, in terms of uh, lockdowns and so on have been stronger in, in, in some areas than others. And crucially, the economic support measures um, that have been provided um, by governments to firms. So I think all, all of these uh, together um, have affected uh, manufacturing outcomes. Um, so it's a mixture of country level factors um, and firm level factors. Um, I, I think I won't have uh, much time to, to go through uh, to each of these, um, but uh, it, it will be, we, we really need to kind of continue thinking through ways in which the, uh, this uh, this pandemic and, and the shock um, have affected industrial policy and the industrialization agenda um, going going forward. Um, maybe I'll just pick up on on, on one or two of these. Um, I think it has underscored uh, the importance of of industrial cap industrial policy and of having productive capacity in manufacturing. So when we think, uh, particularly uh, the experience of, of of last year when. Um, in many countries did not even have enough um, personal protective equipment and, and so on. Um, the countries that were, were better in a better position were those ones that already had some existing manufacturing capacity that was dynamic, that was agile, that could be adapted to produce, whether it be ventilators or sanitizers or whatever. It's not things that can be built up over the, overnight. Either you have it at the time of a shock or, or, or you don't. Um, and I guess as, as part of the kind of uh, building back better agenda that people have been talking about uh, uh, from the pandemic, the idea is not just to kind of go back to the way things were, but to how to use the, the, the rebuilding of the pandemic to also, um, well, I think in, in this case, uh, promote a structural change agenda as well as a more equitable um, uh, e economies. Um, I will pick up the pace because I, th I think uh, I put too many slides here and uh, I'm going to jump uh, a, a lot of them. Um, so, so what I've been talking about up until now was um, maybe uh, just uh, five things which I wanted to pick up on, which are these uh, over here, to say, coming from a structuralist perspective, um, what are some of the changes uh, that, that we need to take account of? Um, and factor into a kind of industrialization perspective um, in the current period. Um, next, I'm just going to talk a bit briefly about uh, the concept which I've been trying to develop of, uh, of, of transformative industrialization. Uh, in some of this, I'll, I'll refer specifically to, to Africa, even though I, I, I know I'm talking to the, the audience from, from Brazil, but I think it's still, it's still relevant um, for, for Africa and for, for developing countries uh, more broadly. Um, but maybe just a few words uh, specifically about Africa, because it is my, my, my own home. Um, we know that Africa is, is the least industrialized uh, region of the world. Um, and over a long period of time um, ha has failed to, to, to seriously uh, industrialize. Um, and in some African countries, even though they are low income African countries, we have what we can call um, pre-industrial deindustrialization. So they've begun to deindustrialize even without uh, having industrialized in any meaningful sense. And when we look at the kind of the big picture of uh, African economies and uh, income per capita today compared to other regions of the world, um, and we compare, for example, in the, the 1950s and, and 1960s, countries like Ghana um, having similar income per capita to countries like South Korea, and now it's a different world. Um, it's just a, the, the divergence is incredible. And obviously it's a, it's a complex uh, story, uh, which I would never reduce to one thing. Um, but I think that industrialization is, is one part of that. And the failure of, of industrialization in Africa is, is one element in the story. 
um, it's brought not only lower growth in, in Africa, but a lack of, of diversification, of complexity, of technological upgrading and uh, robustness in the economies. At a more kind of um, political economy level, it has also meant um, differences in class formation. So uh, there has never really, in, in most African countries, been the development of, of a mass um, industrial working class um, and a, a kind of independent uh, national capitalist class that's independent of, of, of the state, which I think is, has brought a, a range of, um, kind of political and political economy consequences, um, including even in, uh, in voting patterns and conflict and so on. Um, the, the failure of industrialization, I think, also suggests that um, it's more difficult for, for African countries to kind of get into any kind of dynamic uh, growth pooling services on any significant uh, scale. Um, what, what I'm trying to uh, develop and, and suggest in this kind of uh, transformative industrialization agenda is also to emphasize that industrialization is, is about more than growth. So um, growth is obviously a, a crucial outcome uh, so that we expect from industrialization. Um, but industrialization also brings much more than growth. It brings the, brings the transformation of, of, of societies. If, if we look, for example, at even Europe and the first industrial revolution and so on. And when we even go back to kind of original uh, structuralist thinking and before that uh, to, to Marx um, and even other classical economists, when they look at industrial uh, industrialization um, from the first industrial revolution onwards, um, Part of it is about the transformation and the modernization um, of, of societies. Um, so um, what, what characterizes uh, industrialization as, as uh, transformative, uh, I think can have a couple of, of, of different elements. Um, one is that it's, it's systemic. Um, so it, uh, um, it goes beyond uh, just raising economic growth to also addressing societal challenges, uh, like inequality, poverty, unemployment, and so on. Um, I think for, for industrialization to be transformative, it also needs to be disruptive. So disruptive of um, patterns of political economy, um, of production systems, of social relations, and so on, that are not optimal, that are not optimal for, for growth and development. Um, it also needs to be catalytic um, of, of economic and, and social change. Catalytic. Okay, um, and for and part of uh, what we expect of uh, industrialization to be transformative is that the effects are, are long lasting. So in, for example, the industrialized countries of, of, of Europe, even when they deindustrialize over a long period of time, um, the economic and the social effects are, are enduring. So for this, we don't need a stop-start industrialization. We need a, a deep and thoroughgoing uh, industrialization, which brings uh, long-lasting effects. Um, so I think it, it's a part, part of this relates closely to, to um, a traditional kind of structural change uh, uh, agenda, but it's also a bit broader um, because we're looking at uh, industrialization that can be truly transformative. Um, and that also needs to take account of the diversity of, of conditions across countries, um, as well as of the, the various things that we've been talking about, like changing uh, sexual boundaries and so on. Um, so I think some of the things which can make uh, industrialization to, to, to be uh, transformative, um, firstly would be the scale of industrialization. So if we have uh, manufacturing only at a very small uh, percentage of uh, value added and employment in an economy, clearly it can't be transformative. Uh, if, if you were having 5% of, of GDP and employment uh, in, in manufacturing, there's no way that that can be transformative of, of the rest of an economy. Um, manufacturing also needs to be um, have higher productivity and scope for uh, higher cumulative productivity increases, more complex, more innovative, more technologically advanced than the rest of the economy for it to play that uh, transformative role. Um, it's also important for, for industrialization to be not just relying on static comparative advantage, um, but to build on dynamic comparative advantage and to be comparative advantage uh, defying if it is to play that catalytic uh, role of, of being transformative. Um, in part, part of the important uh, channels through which industrialization can be transformative couldn't be through the, the linkages with the, the domestic economy. 
So um, forward and backward linkages, uh, those are being the kind of traditional Hirschmanian linkages, um, but also other forms of linkages. So technological linkages and spillovers, um, learning and, and, and knowledge uh, links and transfers and so on. Um, and for, for industrialization to be transformative, it needs to not just be more technologically advanced than the rest of the economy, but also to, to catalyze um, upgrading in other sectors and to contribute to, to economy-wide uh, productive capabilities. I think there's also a, a political economy aspect um, that for industrialization to play this broadly transformative uh, role, it needs to, to also bring uh, social change. So change in uh, class relations, um, modernization, urbanization, um, uh, bringing more women into, into paid employment and so on. Um, and, and to contribute to, to the societal kind of grand challenges. So beyond growth, also contributing to uh, uh, the mitigation of climate change, uh, to reducing poverty um, and, and so on. So, so to illustrate it with, a, with an example, um, and here I'm, I'm, it's partly in the African context, but I think it's, it's broader for, for developing countries. So um, th th this draws in, 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 in part on a, the chapter that uh, Chris Kramer and, and I were working on, um, uh, but I've kind of tried to, to expand the thinking a bit um, to, to look at industrial hubs. And here I'm referring to industrial um, zones, um, EPZs, IDZs, yeah, industrial district, industrial parks, and so on. Um, and how these can be seen as part of an industrialization agenda um, and contrasting uh, kind of transformative industrialization perspective with a more uh, in, in narrow or non-transformative um, perspective. So I think, oops, sorry. Um, so one of these uh, is, is looking at uh, comparative advantage, firstly, um, that where in the production and in industrial hubs um, is more uh, conforming to existing comparative advantage or based on static comparative advantage, um, versus uh, production, which is um, comparative advantage defying or based on co uh, dynamic comparative advantage. And I guess linked to that is the, pro the profile of what is being produced um, in, uh, in an industrial hub. Is it just producing more of the same, which is produced in the rest of a domestic economy? So in, 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 uh, in some countries, they will set up these export processing zones um, and it's just producing similar to what's produced in the rest of the economy, like textiles or whatever but on a bigger scale. Um, and for me, yes, it might generate foreign exchange, it might generate some jobs, but it's, it's not transformative. So for um, hubs to be uh, the potential for, for being a kind of catalytic or transformative role, it also needs to, to uh, be, be diversifying and upgrading from a country's existing um, production profile. Um, a third aspect is the degree of integration with the rest of a domestic economy. So if we look, for example, at the, the Makila model of uh, um, export processing zones where they operate as, as enclaves quite separate from the rest of the economy, um, that is not going to be transformative in any good way of the domestic economy. So for production and industrial hubs to have that transformative potential, if they need to be integrated um, through, through backward and forward linkages, through technological spillovers and so on. Um, this also relates to what is the kind of uh, the, the policy basis uh, for, for industrial hubs, where these are set up in the kind of uh, Makila type of model, where the attraction of firms to come to the, the, the hub is based on just uh, low wages, terrible working conditions, and so on. The kinds of firms which will be attracted to there are not going to drive a, a, a catalytic or transformative agenda. So from a transformative perspective, um, we would want to see the, the hubs, the attraction to hubs um, as being based on uh, the benefits of clustering and agglomeration, um, on export opportunities, and on positive industrial uh, support rather than exemptions. Um, so, so kind of um, positive incentives rather than saying, oh, you don't have to pay taxes, you don't have to pay uh, decent wages, um, and, and so on. So um, for, in African countries, I think there, there is a potential particularly in countries which have got very weak manufacturing sectors. So in a country which is already industrialized, they might not have a significant uh, role to play. But in countries which have got a very weak and dispersed uh, manufacturing sectors and kind of trying to, to, uh, to progress along the industrialization uh, ladder, 
um, there's the scope um, for, for, for raising, um, for, for cumulative productivity increases, for building productive cap capabilities and so on. But I think what, what is crucial from a, a transformative agenda is that um, these needs to happen both within the hubs and, and beyond, um, and both within manufacturing and, and beyond. Um, otherwise, if it's just limited to manufacturing in the hubs, we cannot say it's playing that uh, catalytic transformative role. Um, so this is where I'm going to, to, to jump. I think my, my time is up. Um, I had hoped, um, but I, I, I was, uh, uh, I've made a, I think I've miscalculated uh, how long I would take to, to, to go through all of this. Um, so I was uh, thinking that I will, I'll talk to, to some of the papers, um, but I'm, I'm really just going to mention them and, and jump all of the, all of the slides. Um, I wanted just to give a, you know, really a, a snapshot of, of some of the, the, the research which uh, we've been doing with some of the, the co-authors, which um, explore in, in, in different ways uh, some of these, um, some of the issues which I think are, are kind of emerging, as I, as I spoke earlier, some of the emerging issues uh, within an industrialization um, agenda. Um, so I'll just mention them with a, a sentence on, on, on each one. Um, with uh, Elvis Avenio, one of my uh, co-authors that we, we, we're working a, a lot together. Uh, I really enjoy working with, uh, with Elvis. Um, we have done an econometric study of um, looking at the effects of um, technology intensity um, on uh, emissions uh, of uh, manufacturing in, in developing countries. So as I mentioned earlier, um, one of the kind of challenges facing industrialization um, is the, the, the need to mitigate uh, carbon emissions because it's, it's known that uh, industrialization is associated with, uh, with uh, more emissions. Um, so in this paper, we look at how does the, the, the contribution to emissions vary by technology intensity. So comparing uh, low tech, medium tech and, and, and high tech uh, manufacturing, um, we find that uh, higher technology manufacturing tends to be less uh, emissions in intensive. Um, when we're, we're comparing it at a country level across countries. So it suggests that kind of one of the industrialization uh, pathways for, for developing countries um, is through, a more te uh, through technological upgrading, which as we know from, a, it brings that, uh, all of the kind of traditional advantages in terms of growth, but here we are suggesting that um, it also provides a kind of part of a, a feasible path towards um, green industrialization. Um, and then, yeah, briefly, some of the work which I've been doing with uh, Com and Naidu. Um, here we have looked, we have used um, World Bank Enterprise Survey data, so firm level data across uh, developing and, and emerging economies um, to analyze uh, firm level manufacturing, um, firm level outcomes among manufacturing firms um, during the COVID period. Um, so uh, from 2020 to, to pre COVID and analyzing uh, the, the country level and the firm level uh, factors that have explained um, the heterogeneity in, uh, uh, in manufacturing firm outcomes. Um, so for example, we found that um, at, a, at a country level, the competitiveness, um, uh, the, the CIP index of, of UNIDO, which we use to kind of uh, proxy for the, the quality of manufacturing within a country um, is an important determinant of uh, firm level outcomes. Um, as well as um, productive capabilities at the firm level. So the kind of productive capabilities at, in firms before the pandemic in terms of production and technological capabilities um, are important in explaining um, uh, the, the ability of firms to survive into the pandemic and to, to uh, not suffer too much of a loss of employment and sales. Um, and then uh, lastly, in, in the African context, uh, work again done with uh, Elvis and uh, a former student of ours, um, we, we analyzed the, the two-way relationship between um, export performance and, and innovation performance um, among uh, African firms. Um, so both uh, exports and, and innovation are, are well recognized as, as important for uh, African countries and, and developing uh, countries uh, more broadly. Um, and here we, we, we look at the relationship um, in both directions. Um, and we find that um, the more innovative uh, firms are, the easier it is for them to both um, break into export markets as well as to become more export intensive, 
um, as well as in the other directions. So firms also kind of learn to innovate by exporting. So the, the more firms export, um, the more likely they are to, to undertake innovation, both uh, product and, and, and uh, process innovation. Um, and we also find that uh, foreign ownership of firms um, and, and having a, an international quality um, certification also strengthens uh, these relationships in, in, in both directions. So I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to, as you see, I, I completely um, was too ambitious about what I will hope to, to present here. I'm, I'm just really jumping to my very last uh, slide here. Um, so, um, yeah, very, very briefly, um, because I, I, I understand for when we were talking with, uh, with uh, Fabio before that uh, the, the conference also includes some, some grad students and so on. So I thought maybe just in the last slide, just to mention what I think are, are some of the kind of interesting and dynamic uh, research directions in, in this field. Um, so firstly, yeah, to the, the kind of uh, interaction between uh, micro, macro and, and firm level analysis. So I think uh, traditionally a kind of structuralist type of research agenda, we focused a lot at the country level um, and at the, at the macroeconomic level. Um, and I think uh, in, in recent years, there's been a lot more kind of firm level analysis, partly because as, as data becomes more and more available. Um, and I think it's, it's really a growing uh, and interesting uh, avenue of research, how to use firm level data. Of course, analyzing firm level data is, is, is nothing new. It's been there for, for, for many years, but analyzing the big questions of industrialization and structural change uh, using firm level uh, data. Um, Subsectoral analysis, as I, as I mentioned in one of my um, early slides, um, one, one of the kind of emerging trends that we've seen um, is more heterogeneity within sectors uh, than was previously the case. Um, so more diversity within manufacturing within services and so on. So it suggests the need for, for more uh, nuanced and more disaggregated in analysis. Um, and I think there's a, a lot of promising uh, research uh, work in, in this area. Um, so kind of zooming below the, the sectoral uh, level. Um, I think, uh, yeah, there's, um, also promising research directions around um, comparative advantage. So um, we didn't have to, uh, well, I think it's, it's well recognized that the, it's, it's important to, for, for countries to follow a dynamic um, comparative advantage perspective. It's well established at the theoretical level. Um, and I think there's a, a lot of potential for, for studies that are kind of analyzing this empirically. What does it mean in a particular context? How far ahead? of a country's existing comparative advantage, um, can they jump? There's many debates around this, but I think there's a, a real gap in terms of um, empirical work. Um, uh, value chains, as I mentioned earlier, is, is not new, but are becoming uh, increasingly important. Um, and obviously there, there's a, already a huge amount of, of uh, research on, on, on value chains, um, but I think there's still a, a lot of scope for, for dynamic work in this area, in particular in relation to, to upgrading and productive capabilities. Um, the reason why I've mentioned here innovation, technological change, and industrial development, um, obviously each of these are long-standing research areas with um, journals dedicated to them and conferences and the work of Globalix and, 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 and so on. But I often feel that uh, there's not enough integration um, between these uh, kind of scholarly communities. So we often find innovation scholars kind of working and industrial people working um, and perhaps uh, yeah, not enough uh, connection at, at, the, at the nexus of that. Um, green industrialization, uh, clearly it's a, it's a growing area. Um, and I think perhaps uh, for, for, for young scholars who are looking for uh, an area to kind of become a, a, a leading experts in, obviously there are people, many people already working in it. Um, but I think it's an area that is only going to grow um, in future. Yeah, let me just uh, maybe leave it there on that. Um, and uh, lastly, just to say thank you to the, to the organizers um, and to acknowledge the, um, the work that I've drawn on here from, from co-authors. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to go into in detail, um, but in, in particular, Elvis, as well as the, the other co-authors. Um, so thanks for the time. And I'm sorry if I went over, I'm going to leave it there. Okay, thank you again, Fiona, for this illuminating presentation. It's always wonderful to hear about your research and your ideas. So now we have some time for questions and answers. 
you can all use the chat box. I see here that we already have some questions. So Luis Fernando de Paula uh, is asking, could Fiona provide basic papers related to the presentation? And Thiago Miguez is asking, uh, should I read in Portuguese or because Fiona can read in, <laughs> in the chat box, right? <laughs> Due to very strict fiscal rules, uh, there have been a new orientation, the Brazilian government industrial policy using no money. Do you think that this is possible? Is there any low cost measures Brazil and other developing countries could implement? Or are we just doomed? This is a very good question. Uh, let me collect a few more questions and why not? Okay, so we, we already have another one. Rafael is asking, what are the limited limits and challenges for financing innovative industrialization in Africa? Is the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative project the best solution currently available for this? And how to think about the environmental agenda in this new pattern of innovation, technology, technological change, and industrial development? So Luis. Uh, is also asking, what is your view about regime of growth for developing countries, export-led growth, wage-led growth, some mixed strategy? Uh, let me add two questions of my own, <laughs> and then we can, oh, Juliano, Juliano is here. Juliano, you want to open? Okay. Thank you very much for your brilliant presentation. Uh, my question is, how do you think of catching up process in the commodities export countries? Okay. So let me add two questions and then we can get back to you, Fiona. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, so my first question, I want to get back to a topic of your presentation, the, the so-called reshoring, right? So what, uh, how do you understand the, the factors, especially those of the political economy and those that are associated with intellectual property re regimes that could be behind a possible increase in, in reshoring strategies? And of course, how this would affect uh, developing countries? And my second question, uh, it's about gender. <laughs> it was not a topic that you talked about, uh, but I know that you have research about gender. Uh, so I would, like, I would like to know a little bit more about how the topic of gender rises up on your research and how do you see the advances of dissident approaches in treating gender as a category of analysis? Okay. Okay, th th that's a lot of questions. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll make some comments on them. Um, but uh, Marilia, I'm also thinking that uh, you know it's, it's a small group here and it will also be nice to to have a bit of an interactive uh, discussion if it's uh, if it's possible from from your side so i will make some comments but i would also like to to hear the uh, um the, the views of of, uh, of colleagues here so maybe rather than me answering everything um if it's okay with you i would also like to hear you know, anyone feel free to to answer uh, in portuguese or, or or english uh yeah let me just start with the, the last ones um, from Giuliano and, and Marilia and then come back to, to the chat. Um, Giuliano was asking about uh, catching up in a commodity exporting country. Um, so I, I, I guess I, I kind of subscribe to in a way more uh, traditional structuralist type views about the limits of uh, catching up through, through commodity exporting. Um, you know the, the the dangers of um uh, uh, of cycles uh, from a reliance on on commodity exports particularly when it's a, a narrow basket of of exports and uh, how it can be fiscally uh, uh, destabilizing um and that uh, reliance on on commodity exports can contribute to kind of a dutch disease uh, type of uh, effects 
Um, so obviously, I think countries that have, that have the commodities and that can export them, uh, nobody is going to say, no, don't do, do such. But the point is that it's not enough, right? Um, and I, particularly, I, I think, okay, let me put it in my own context of uh, African countries, which are, are commodity exporters, um, and maybe at a lower levels of industrialization than what you are thinking about maybe in the Latin American context. Um, whether it's commodity exports um, of, of minerals and uh, also of, of uh, agricultural goods, um, it, it, I think an industrialization agenda can link in with those existing strengths. Because when we have low income countries um, that have very little uh, industrialization to go on, it's not that uh, one day they're just going to start a, a, a huge auto sector, uh, auto manufacturing sector, um, or a nanotechnology sector, whatever. So sometimes it's, it's good to also build on those existing uh, strengths and capabilities, but to see how, how to be more involved along the value chain. So instead of just uh, uh, exporting the commodity, but to be more involved in, in the processing and so on. So it's nothing new what I'm saying. I, I guess it's a, it's a traditional, in, in some ways, a structuralist uh, thinking. Um, but I mean, I, I guess in, 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 a, in a sentence, my, my answer would be that I, I don't, I, I think it's very difficult to, to, to have sustained high rates of economic growth through commodity exports over a long period of time. There's countries like Botswana, which have achieved it to some extent, um, but I, I believe that without, a, without it going along with an industrialization agenda, it would be very difficult to, to catch up. Um, and then uh, Marilia's uh, uh, two questions, um, the, the, the reshoring, um, and you were asking in particular around the kind of intellectual property um, aspects uh, of part of that. I think it, it comes back to the, the discussion which, which I was talking about in um, global value chains and uh, the, the nature of integration into global value chains. And this issue that the, the lead firms, which typically would be based in the advanced economies, would tend to have the, the power to control um, to a large extent uh, activities and, and intellectual property within that. So it puts developing countries in a, in a vulnerable position um, if the only involvement in the value chain is through the, the kind of uh, low cost uh, assembly. Um, and there's not much more to offer uh, than that. And there's no upgrading and that's all there is to offer because that can be moved around. It can be reassured, for example, through automation, it might be if you're only if you if all you're offering is, is low cost labor, um, it, it, it makes you very vulnerable because it can move to another developing country or can be reshored uh, to the advanced economy and uh, robotized. Um, so again, for, for me, the, the bigger point that it kind of highlights um, is the need for for upgrading in the value chains and for integration between the, the, the kind of the linking up and linking back argument. Yeah. Um, and then uh, around the issue of, of uh, gender, um, it, it's a big issue. I'll just say uh, a few words. Um, yeah, as, as you mentioned, it's something which I've been working on uh, also with one of my other co-authors, um, Izdesh um, from, from Turkey. Um, I, I couldn't cover uh, everything in, in today's presentation. Um, but what we have been looking at in some of our work is um, a gendered approach uh, to industrial development. Um, and the differences between um, different kinds of industrialization paths um, in terms of the effects on, uh, on gender equity. Um, so we have been arguing, for example, that uh, a, 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 an industrialization path, which is based on you know, low wage, low skill, low productivity, um, and just brings women in as, uh, as low cost of labor, um, is not empowering to women. Just having a job per se, is not, is not something which is uh, transformative of, of uh, gender relations. So it, it relates to the, you know, the nature of the, of the industrialization path. Um, and then we have also argued that even a kind of a high tech industrialization path, it doesn't automatically become uh, a, a gender uh, equitable. It's something that needs to be factored in um, by policy makers. Um, and I guess it also relates to the kind of the, the broader transformative agenda of, of industrialization to go beyond just saying, yes, we want balance of payments, we want employment. Obviously, those things are important. It's not to say that they're not important, but to, to take a, a kind of a, a broader social uh, perspective on it. Um, let me come to some of those in the, in the chat uh, from uh, Luis Fernando. Um, yes, I will share the, some of the, the, the background papers. 
um, with uh, uh, Fabio and, and Marilia. Uh, th thanks for the interest. Um, uh, uh, Tiago's question, um, I, I will comment, but I would also like to, to hear on this one, the, the, the views from other colleagues. Um, industrial policy with no money, I don't see how it's possible. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't see how it's possible. Um, you know, industrial policy, even in, in America, they, they put a, a lot of uh, money on it, even if they don't call it uh, industrial policy. Um, of course, not everything in industrial policy necessarily takes money. Some of it is kind of an, an, an orientation, but to give a, a support to industry, it costs money. And, to, and I think for industrial policy to, to work, it has to be on a, a, a sufficient scale to have an impact. So maybe to draw on the experience of South Africa, I think in, in recent years, we have actually had um, pretty decent industrial policy. Uh, the, the policies on paper, I think is good policies, um, but we have lacked an alignment with a macroeconomic policy um, and, a lack, and not enough uh, fiscal support for the industrial policy. So the people who are critics of uh, industrial policy, um, it's easy to say, oh, look, industrial policy is not working because manufacturing is still not growing. So why are we even wasting money supporting the auto sector or whatever? Let's just uh, use the money for something else. But if you don't do something on a, on a, on a big enough scale, uh, it's, it's doomed to fail and it becomes a self-fulfilling uh, <laughs> prophecy because then it's not working because it's too small. And then the critics say, oh, it's not working. So put even less money uh, towards it. Yeah. Um, uh, Raphael's question, um, the limits and challenges for, for innovative industrialization. Um, sure, it's a, it's a big question. There's a lot of questions here. Um, let me think about these. There are, there, are, there are too many questions it's about environment and, and uh, China and, and so on. Um, let me come back to this one. Um, another question from, from uh, Luis Fernando. Um, I think for, for me, it's a, it's a mixed strategy. Um, and even when we look at the experiences of uh, successful industrialization, maybe in, in East Asia, um, it's been a mixed strategy. People uh, like to clar sometimes classify it as an export-led growth. Um, and exports was a, a very uh, important focus of, of industrial policy in, in South Korea and so on. But there was also a lot of uh, import protection and these, the, and these were linked. So it was, a, I think the important thing was about the, the rents management um, that uh, uh, where, where firms are, um, are having uh, uh, benefits that, that has to be plowed back into, into upgrading, uh, into investment, building capabilities, becoming more technologically advanced, becoming more uh, competitive and so on. Um, so I think uh, in terms of uh, protection, um, for me, trade protection remains an important uh, tool in the toolkit of, of, uh, of developing countries. Um, it's clear that uh, for, especially for low income countries, but even for middle income countries, um, the trade protection remains important. And that if you, if you liberalize with tariffs, it's just likely to, co to contribute uh, to deindustrialization. Um, but I think it's, it's important that that protection and those benefits to industry, it doesn't just become a kind of a, free money in the in the hands of uh, industrial capital um but that it has to be you have to manage the rents as a as a state so that that bits put back into in, into upgrading i'm not sure is the answer to your question but it, it, yeah let me let me leave it there and maybe hear, uh, hear some comments from from other people Okay, so <laughs> people, you can use the, the chat box or open your mic, whatever you feel more comfortable. I can also translate. So if you want to, to write in Portuguese.
Hi, Marilesh. Thiago here. Please, Thiago. Go Hi. ahead. I have the video. Thanks, Joanna, for your answer. The reason for my question uh, about the just of all is no money. I do believe, of course, that it's not possible, but this is the, the kind of orientation we are receiving from the Brazilian government. And they believe that only some uh, law engagement is enough to drive investment. And we have seen the no results of this kind of policy in the last five or six years. And it's nice now to have someone as important as you record that it's not possible. I think I'm gonna show it to my bosses now. And, but uh, it, it's, it's exactly what we're saying. We see uh, USA, we see Europe, for example, I work the uh, automobile industry. Mm -hmm. Sorry, my dog is barking. She's a little bit angry today. And because I'm talking about the government maybe. And we see, I mean, the, the Europe is putting, I think, 1 billion in only in batteries for electrical vehicles. And here we are talking about 50 million. I mean, there's no way to compete like that. And that's, that was my concern when I, when I did that question. And maybe if we have something, I mean, Brazil, we have some industries, so it's, I don't see this margin of low cost implementation now because we have something and we need to, to push industry. And to push industry, we need money. There is no way. The companies are already here, and but they are not. As, as, there, there was a part in your presentation which I think was very good. When you say that here in Brazil, we don't have like Brazilian capitalists. So they, all the innovative activities are not in Brazil. They are abroad. So how do we, can we change uh, the way we act, not only in global value chains, but also in national industry, if you have all the value activities are abroad. I mean, there, there is no way in, we need to invest, we need money. How can we do something to change? So that was the, the, the reason I, I did that question. To see if there are any hope, but maybe not. Can I just add some thoughts, Chago? Because if you want to hear, I think we passed the, the time where we were talking about some industrial policy agenda. We have recently witnessed the criminalization of industrial policy. So also we have the public agent afraid of doing some things that uh, in not such a long time ago, uh, we were leading the world, right? So. Yeah, just to, to uh, sorry, sorry, Shana, just to repeat, Go ahead, I'll comment right? after that, yeah. Yes, I was just about to say that uh, the short-term economic policy here in Brazil, um, it, it, in general, for example, our fiscal policy has uh, a kind of primary spending cap. Uh, and because of that, we just can adjust uh, the, the expenditures and make the stem, them stay uh, in this cap uh, by like cutting the public investments. We have a ser series of uh, mandatory spendings. Uh, they are like occupying all the, the space that we have in fiscal policy and to not like uh, go up this spending cap, we need to adjust uh, through public investment cutting it. Uh, in terms of monetary policy, uh, in general, Brazil has a very conservative monetary policy interest. Uh, the basic interest rate in Brazil is usually and historically very high, uh, even compared to uh, our like uh, emerging countries' uh, pairs. And we have a very volatile exchange rate. Uh, and usually this is bad for planning investment and making business as well. So uh, the short-term economic policy, by this uh, short-term economic policy, I mean these three uh, economic policy, the exchange rate policy, the monetary policy, and fiscal policy, they do not help uh, industrial policy. And at the same time, as Marilia said, and Thiago said as well, uh, we have somehow um, brought <laughs> into being in Brazil a kind of uh, free market ideology, ideology 
uh, that's driving how uh, the public policy and the public agency uh, happens here in Brazil. So I guess that uh, by all sides, industrial policy and industry in Brazil uh, is under attack and is in, in a very fragile situation. So just to make this comment. Thanks. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to all of the comments and let me just make a couple of uh, reactions. Um, I think that uh, Tiago was, was referring to the, the auto sector and uh, public support for the, the auto sector. Um, as far as I'm aware, I don't, I don't know of any country of the world that has a, an auto sector which doesn't receive government support. <laughs> it seems to be one of those sectors of the economy that uh, it's supported through industrial policy incentives and so on um, everywhere where there's any significant uh, auto sector. Um, and I think uh, it's something which if, if it's not supported, it can it can leave. And sometimes people question, oh, why give uh, money to this auto sector and so on. It's one of those sectors which uh, I think is a mainstay of, of, of manufacturing um, and has such important uh, backward and forward linkages and uh, skills transfers and so on that um, if it declines or if you lose that, it really contributes to, to deindustrialization um, in a country. Um, some of the comments, I think, from uh, you know, Tiago and others was talking about how industrial policy became a kind of dirty word in, in, in Brazil. Um, and it's ironic because uh, in recent years, uh, I think industrial policy became more acceptable internationally. <laughs> I mean, we, we know, you know even within the IMF and so on, um, uh, international organizations, governments, um, it, it, it became much more acceptable now to talk about industrial policy than it was even five or, or, or 10 years ago. Um, but of course, people have very different understandings of, of industrial policy. When people in the IMF talk about it, it's going to be very different from what uh, some of us mean by industrial policy in terms of the objectives and, and the measures and so on. But I think definitely it became uh, more widely accepted than previously. So it's ironic that now in, in Brazil, uh, we find uh, the opposite. Uh, maybe it's something hopefully we can, can change uh, next October. Um, but uh, one of the, the also important points that came up for, for me from the comments was the, the relationship between um, industrial policy and, and uh, macroeconomic policy. Um, and I think it has been part of the downfall of industrial policy in, in many Latin American countries, uh, as well as more broadly, that unless you have um, a close alignment and a supportive macroeconomic policy, both on the monetary and, and fiscal side, your industrial policy won't succeed. And it's one of the problems we've had also in South Africa. Um, so where you have uh, an austere monetary, um, monetary policy, um, uncompetitive exchange rates, uh, high interest rates, um, and we have already talked a few minutes ago about the lack of uh, fiscal support, um, then you could have the best industrial policy in the world, but you won't see the, the results in terms of uh, industrialization or, or reindustrialization. And again, it's one of those things where then uh, critics can easily blame that, oh, manufacturing is declining anyway. So why should it be supported through industrial policy? Um, but if it's undermined by conservative macroeconomic policy, uh, there's nothing that industrial policy can, can do. You can have whatever industrial policy you want to, given incentives and so on, but it can be undermined by, the, uh, by macroeconomic policy. Um, I also just wanted to say, I saw in, in, in one of the comments that I didn't get to in the, in the chat, um, is, is you're referring to the, the, the China Belt and, and, and Road Initiative. Um, I'm thinking about uh, maybe putting Danilo on the spot here. Um, Danilo and I and, and Elvis are, are working on a paper together on the um, uh, effects of, of, of China on uh, industrialization in uh, developing countries. Uh, we had actually thought of it, maybe um, bringing some of it into, the, into this presentation today. Um, but I, I think uh, Danilo might have some, some comments about that. Uh, if he doesn't mind me putting him on the spot. I don't know if Danilo is still in the room. Maybe oh, okay, did we lose Danilo? Okay, yeah, it's fine. But we, maybe we'll share the, 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 maybe we'll come back and, and share the research some other time. Oh yeah, Danilo left, I, don't, I, I didn't see as well, but he left. Okay, no, no problem, yeah. So should we collect a few more questions? 
questions? What do you think, Fabio? <laughs> well, let me reinforce your call for more <laughs> questions and comments. Well, I don't think we have any more questions. We had a few of them. It was really nice, yeah. this, this period of Q&A. So, Fiona, thank you again yeah. for having the time, managing your time. And it was uh, such a, a nice panel. Uh, and we hope that we can welcome you in person here. Yeah. <laughs> maybe next year or the following year okay yeah no th thanks again and it's nice to see here people uh, that i haven't seen for a long time lou fernando we've met in a conference before and uh, <laughs> wins uh, esther uh, marilia and so on um so yeah hopefully we'll we'll meet in in, in person um and uh, i hope that the rest of the conference goes well thank you thank thanks. you very much fiona Thank you very much, Fiona. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Marita, as well, for uh, managing the room. Thank you. <laughs>